cinephiles. I'm Kat Liddell, and welcome to Wild Reverse Film Radio, the official podcast of the Wild Reverse Film Festival on KCIW 100.7 FM. For today's interview, we're sitting down with Dr. Marilyn Hart. Dr. Hart is Professor Emerita of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and still teaches statistics at Southwestern Oregon Community College. She also recently shared a friendship with the late Elma Williams, an award-winning Hollywood editor, director, and producer who retired to Brookings later in life. After spending years as a philanthropist in the community, Elma Williams passed away in 2015 at the age of 102. Marilyn will be sharing some wonderful anecdotes about both Williams' legacy in the film industry, as well as his years in Brookings and his ongoing impact on the Wild River's coast. But before we get started, we'd like to thank Wild Rivers Film Festival's presenting sponsor for 2024, KDRV Newswatch 12 out of Medford, Oregon. Thank you, Newswatch 12, for making the film festival possible this year. This year's Wild River Film Festival is also brought to you in part by the Tallawadaney Nation, the Oregon Community Foundation, the Ford Family Foundation, Travel Curry Coast, the Roundhouse Foundation, and the City of Brookings. Are you interested in sponsoring the Wild Rivers Film Festival and our mission to celebrate indie cinema on the Wild Rivers Coast? You can learn more on our website, wildriversfilmfestival.com. If this is the first you're hearing about the Wild Rivers Film Festival, we are so glad you're joining us tonight. The Wild Rivers Film Festival is a celebration of indie and local cinema that happens during the third week of every August in Brookings. Over the course of four days, we screen more than four dozen films at three locations across the city. Many of our film screenings include Q&A sessions from visiting filmmakers. Our festival also includes daily educational panels, VIP parties, and a not-to-be-missed awards ceremony on the final day of the fest. Festival passes are now on sale at wildriversfilmfestival.com. We can't wait to see you at the show. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Kat Liddell. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Marilyn Hart to talk about the life and legacy of the late Hollywood editor, director, and producer Elmo Williams. A longtime friend of Elmo, Dr. Hart is Professor Emerita of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and still teaches statistics at the Southwestern Oregon Community College. She received her PhD from the Illinois Institute of Technology and specializes in statistical process control to improve quality. Dr. Hart has taught this subject for industry and healthcare all over the U.S., as well as in India, China, and Europe. Dr. Marilyn Hart, thank you so much for joining us on Wild Rivers Film Radio. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here, um, especially because you're so knowledgeable about um, Elma Williams' life, and you're just so passionate about telling a story. And um, we know that we know that you enjoyed a long friendship with Elmo when he lived here in Brookings, but uh, the community has grown and, and new generations have, have both been born and come of age since his death almost 10 years ago. So for those who don't know him very well um, and don't know very much about Elmo Williams, could you tell us uh, more about his career in the film and television industry? Just give us an overview. Okay, he's a, a real legend. Uh, he's most famous for Gary Cooper's High Noon uh, that was produced by Stanley Kramer. And when that film first came finished and put in the can, Kramer said, I'm embarrassed by this film. I'm not going to release it. You know, I'm going to talk to my lawyers. I'm going to see what I could do because this film is embarrassing. So Elmo said, hey, you know, can I take it home over the three-day weekend and work on it and see what I could do? So he re-edited it over the weekend, mind you. And the rest is film history. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is an iconic film. It won four Academy Awards. Gary Cooper for, you know, Best Actor. Elmo for Film Editing. Mm -hmm. And the uh, score by uh, Dimitri uh, Tiamkin. And the best song, that Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, Mm -hmm. won Best Song that year. And, you know, the rest is just movie history. And in fact, you know, when they uh, Cleopatra was being made with Liz Taylor... Uh, many years later, it was breaking the company because it was so over budget. It was six hours long. It was terrible. They literally called up Elmo and said, hey, can you wave your magic wand on this film too? So he re-edited it, put in some new scenes and all that kind of stuff. And the industry did not go broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So um, yeah, some of his his biggest known projects were really in that, that golden age of cinema in like the 50s and 60s. And it sounds like um, where some other projects that he worked on around that time that people might recognize. Well, A Tora Tora Tora, mm-hmm. The Longest Day, mm-hmm. The Magnificent Men and Their Flying Machines, 
the Blue Max. And, uh, you know, for instance, um, with Julie Andrews, uh, at the beginning of the Sound of Music, when she swings around on the top of the mountain, mm-hmm. you know, the hills are alive. Elmo put that scene in. Oh, I mean, so he just had some magic touches. Yeah. But his first editing, real editing film, where he sort of got credit, he, he was working in England and he was too young, supposedly, to be old enough to get a certificate to work there. So what they did is they gave him the credit under the company's name. Okay. But it was with um, Cary Grant. Oh. As the Amazing Adventures of Ernest Bliss. And it is a delightful film. In fact, our book club finally read the book and then watched the movie uh, and just Mm -hmm. just had a delight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the old black and white films are just like, Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like sometimes he he didn't get like a named credit for everything that he did. No, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, like, it sounds like it's, like, is it possible, did he ever mention like a, that being like possibly like a more common practice in the industry at the time? Or? No, what, ha- what happened was, yeah. is, well, how he got his start is he was a, a car hop <laughs> uh, at, you know, one of these uh, fast food places type mm-hmm. of thing. And uh, Meryl White mm-hmm. came in as a customer and because Elmo was the new kid and uh, White was really tough to work on mm-hmm. or worth, that they asked Elmo, hey, you go wait on him. Mm-hmm. And so Meryl White said, hey, kid, I noticed you're a hard worker and my uh, assistant just quit and I'm leaving for England in two weeks. Would you like the job? Oh, wow. So he took the job and he didn't have a work permit to work there. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of why he wasn't getting film credits is because he was that. And a lot of this you find out in his interviews. What happened was, is at the Chutko uh, Playhouse, mm-hmm. Alain Goddard uh, did over 20 interviews mm-hmm. with Elmo. And Claire Willard was on a camera. Mm-hmm. And Mike Moran was the announcer. And the Chetco players, uh, Pelican players, did all the scenery and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And anyhow, he goes and he talks about the histories of some of these things, which is just amazing mm-hmm. how films were made back then, you know, on the contracts and what, what these stars, what their personalities were, and the little crazy things that Elmo had to do to get things to cooperate right and just it was amazing yeah no there was a really good run like there especially in like the the mid aughts and and into like the early 2010s of of him like doing those interviews and like gaining those insights about his about his career and the films that he worked on which was really awesome to uh to see that history Mm kind of getting spelled out for people here in this community and um, I know that there's a, a project right now um, where we're trying to get those digitized and like actually like available for um, for public access, like through an archive. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yes, please. Uh, mm-hmm. What happened was, is the last interview was what? I'm looking at the date here. Um, to 2011. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's already 13 years ago. Yeah. Discs don't last that long. No. And so when I finally talked to Lon Goddard and says, look, you can't let all this history go. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got to do something with it. So my son's the state archivist of Hawaii. And so I finally got the two of them together and he convinced Lon to donate those interviews. And I think it was of all the discs he gave him, 13 were already, you know, decrepit. I mean, you, you couldn't do anything with them. Yeah. So uh, what Adam did is digitized all of them. He's trying to then AI it up so that it's a higher quality, you know, picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're going to be on the Hawaii State Archives then eventually. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, I've been giving some of them to Sue. And so you guys could already start looking at them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and type of thing. And it's just amazing, the history there. It's just fascinating. And, you know, he was a history buff. You know, he was a neighbor of mine, which is how I got to know Elmo, by the way. Mm-hmm. He lived three doors down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was so much fun because oh, we would get the neighbors, the whole neighborhood together, like every other month, you know, with a potluck type of thing. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we got to do a lot of talking and things like that uh, then. And he was just, he would just talk about all kinds of things. For instance, uh, I'm a huge Disney fan, in case those of you haven't <laughs> noticed. Mm-hmm. And he worked for Walt Disney, he worked for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, mm-hmm. for which he was nominated for Best Film Editor. He didn't get that one, but 
Disney gave him a mouse car, which is the Disney equivalent of an Oscar. Mm-hmm. And I think only like 18 people ever got one of those. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it was really, really special. And Elmo used to talk about how he was more proud of his mouse car than he was of his Oscar. Uh, and he said it broke his heart to leave Disney. He thought Disney was one of the nicest people in the whole world. He was such a kind, thoughtful man. For instance, when Elmo adopted one of his daughters, mm-hmm. uh, Walt Disney had his crew build a miniature village of Disney characters mm-hmm. and had it delivered to the house to welcome home. The, I think she was two at the time. Mm-hmm. And he says he was just so sweet and thoughtful, but Elmo wanted to work on his own projects. Mm-hmm. So he said he really had to leave, but he says it just broke his heart. Mm-hmm. But you, you listen to his interviews about how he worked with, with Walt. And for instance, in one of those, all those underwater scenes, the director was afraid of water. So they asked Elmo, we know you're just the editor, but could you, you know, do the underwater scenes? And Elmo said, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. And he had never done that before. Okay. okay. And he said the first time down, he got so full of water. It's like, let me up, let me up, let me up. And he says the second time he was more calm. He knew what to do. And so all those underwater scenes were his. But, you know, he researched all his history types of things. So back to Torah, Torah, Torah. You know, he he worked with all these historians. He worked with some of the generals, you know, that had been on the projects and things like that. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to keep them as as historically accurate as possible. And he talks about those in those interviews. So it's just like, wow. I mean, they're just such a font of knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. Such a font of knowledge. Yeah. No, that's, he's had a, he had an incredible, like, wide spanning career as far as genre seems to go, which is, which is just really, like, it's just astounding to me, like the the amount of different variety of projects that that he worked on. Oh, he worked on some yeah. crazy films too. I mean, you know, you know yeah. Saudi Bottom USA, and, you know, <laughs> Juan Bates. Right. And, I mean, some weird stuff. Uh huh. Yeah, it's yeah. Not really, everything one's best picture. Right? Yeah. No, but some of them were so historically important mm-hmm. that were just unreal, just uh-huh. unreal. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you you got to know uh, Elmo just by by virtue of, of being his neighbor. You lived a few houses down from him. Um, do you did he ever mention to you like what? Uh, I know this is a, a very popular retirement area, but like what brought him to Brooking specifically? Do you know? As I recall, he, he told me that they were driving up and down the coast mm-hmm. and just fell in love with Brookings. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I've heard that story from so many people. I'm a volunteer at the Capella by the Sea, which is by the way. Elmo donated oh, yeah. that to the city. They'll discuss yeah, the that one with the one in the yeah. park. Yeah. And I'll, uh, so many people come by and they tell me that they just fall in love with this town. That everybody's so friendly mm-hmm. and you know just just so welcoming and so many things to do. I mean, there's such an art community here, and we've got a community college, and it's just amazing. Yeah, mm-hmm. so common experience. Yeah, and he had it as well. Yeah, yeah he <laughs> fell in love with the place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, you you mentioned a, a pretty significant gift that he gave to the city, um, and I, it's very clear Elmo was was just a person who, who really believed in just giving back to the community that he was in. And um, mm-hmm. if you want to talk more uh, about that Capella project, and um, you know how, what kind of impact does that have on people today? Um, that that building that we have in the park, you know, what was the process like, and and what lasting impact do you think it has? Well. How Elmo got around to doing this is two years before uh, Lorraine had died, they were vacationing and saw uh, Thor and Crown in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, mm-hmm. which is a beautiful, huge chapel that they fell in love with. Okay. And when his wife died, he decided that that's what he was going to do for her. He was going to build a chapel in her honor. Mm-hmm. And so he uh, hired the same architectural firm that built Thor and Crown to design a smaller version oh. and had it built here at costs approximately $750,000, so it was no small amount. He said he talked to his kids. They said, was that okay with them? And they said, Dad, it's your money. You know, if you want to do that for Mom, go right ahead. Mm-hmm. And so he did. And he said he wanted to – he had talked to us about this one time when he was at our – and happened to be at our house that time. In fact, I could tell you how Bella got its name. <laughs> we were all sitting around, all you know, all the neighbors around the dinner table talking about it. He says, you know, I can't call it a chapel. He says, so what am I going to call it? So my late husband went to this uh, Webster's second edition on a bridge and looked up chapel and it said Capella. Mm-hmm. And he said, so just like that, I almost said, that's what I'll call it, Capella by the Sea. And that's how it got its name. Mm-hmm. Uh, Capella actually means cape, but mm-hmm. then the cape of this one saint was kept in this little chapel 
structure, mm-hmm. so the names became associated together. Right, yeah, you got to love linguistics, yeah. Yeah, and right, yeah, how, the, how words change and, yeah. and evolve over time. Right. But anyhow, what he wanted to do, and he had mentioned this that time too, he says, everybody's so busy and crazy with their lives right now. He says he wanted a place where people would just go to sit and be quiet and meditate and mm-hmm. find peace. And indeed, being a, a volunteer there, some people just come in and look at the architecture and oh how beautiful this is and that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but i've had some people come in and say can i just sit here quietly for a few minutes and just contemplate and then one time i mean this this was magic i had a lady who came up to me said could i bring my harp in to practice here because this would be the perfect place for music so she went out to her car brought in her harp and she's playing just gorgeous music and two other people came in, and one of them just started doing interpretive dancing oh. to this music. And it was like magic. And these two ladies didn't know each other. And mm-hmm. afterwards, they hugged and kissed. And it was just like, you know, wow, this is fantastic. And again, I like the way it just brings people together. And at Christmas time, with the lights going on, you know, with the light festival, oh, gosh, I love volunteering at that mm-hmm. time because it's magic. Uh-huh. Everybody comes in and just so happy. And mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely one of my favorite times of year to visit. Yeah, since that's the place I like best out of going to the light show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of weddings there. Yes, and uh, memorial services. People have renewed their vows there and everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, it it serves a purpose for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a place for people to come together. Yeah, Alma was indeed hoping that it would be a a destination type of thing for weddings because he thought that would bring money to the community. Yeah, so that was another thing he had mentioned when he was talking about having it built mm-hmm. yeah yeah so definitely it has it's had a profound ad- impact i'd like I'd, I'd like to think that it's just it's a great place for it. it's a great gathering place it's a great reflection place mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. that's that's wonderful yeah we have people from all over the world that come here not just from around the area i mm-hmm. you know get people from uh, a lot from uh, australia they're a bunch of travelers mm-hmm. germans uh i met some people from romania once i mean just everybody yeah. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Kat Liddell. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Marilyn Hart, who's here to share about the life and legacy of the late Elmo Williams. Elmo Williams was a Hollywood editor, director, and producer who spent his latter years in the Brookings Harbor area. He passed away in 2015, but his legacy can still be felt in our area today, and Dr. Hart is one of several people helping to preserve that history. Uh, so, Marilyn, speaking of Elmo's impact on the area, uh, you and others in the community are quite active in your efforts to make sure that his legacy lives on. And that also includes getting the city of Brookings to rec- recognize last Sunday in April as Elmo Williams Day. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that project, um, like how that came about and what you all hope to achieve by commemorating him in that way? It started, yeah, in 2017, Carolyn Milliman, who has died a few years ago and I'm sorely, sorely missed, Mm -hmm. um, she had decided that we need to honor him. Mm -hmm. So she went to the city council and said, hey, look, we've got to do this. And indeed, they declared the last Sunday in April, Elmo Williams Day, because that's closest to his birthday. Okay. You know, and he, he died at 102. I know, yeah. And, you know, there's a moral to that there because I never saw that man without a twinkle in his eye or a smile on his face. Mm-hmm. He was always helping people. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, there's a moral. Yeah. So what we've been doing is uh, at high noon, in honor of his, his famous movie, so at mm-hmm. noon, we meet at the Capella, and I bring in all the memorabilia that I have that we have from his film and his personal life and, and everything else. And we, and we tell stories and, you know, share things about what we remember from Elmo. Yeah. And then what we've been doing the last few years is we've been showing a movie of his. And this last year, because now I have these interviews, yes. I took a 22-minute excerpt of High Noon's interview for that. And I'll tell you, those people were glued yeah. to the screen when they showed that interview afterwards. Everybody stayed after the movie. And uh, after it was over, they were still staying and talking to each other, talking to me. It was just just real exciting mm-hmm. to see that happen. Mm-hmm. And especially because he was so historical in the film industry. I mean, he was kind of there from the beginning, the golden age yeah, yeah. type of thing. That uh, to preserve that history and also because he's one of our own. I mean, he did mm-hmm. so much for the community, not only with the Capella, but they did a lot for the park, for instance, and our library. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, uh, I was told Lorraine took classes to learn how to write grants so she can get grant money yes. for our library when it was first being built. Mm-hmm. 
So between the two of them, they just did so much. And those interviews, too, when Elma would show them, as I recall, it was, t- I remember because I went to a lot of them, and they were $10. But what he did is every other one, the money went for the Chetco Playhouse, mm-hmm. and every other one, the money went for the the capella Mm -hmm. so i mean he didn't pocket any of that Mm -hmm. it was all to get money fundraising for the community yeah that's incredible and uh, it's amazing as speaking of of, um, his contributions to the library too it should be noted for our listeners that if anyone wants to like really dig in like in depth to his life we have um we have a three volume set of his memoirs at the library that are available for people to check out as well as a copy of um some letter a collection of letters from his wife Lorraine. Oh, they are amazing, too. They can be found at the library. And uh, if you really want to dig into that history, uh, you can go check that out and uh, and access that for free. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were a perfect pair. They really Mm -hmm. were. Um, And in Mm -hmm. fact, she helped him a lot on his movies and productions. When he did The Cowboy, she wrote the script. Really? Yes. Uh And those magnificent men in their flying machines. She Mm -hmm. wrote the first few lines of that song because she said they needed a spunky song to get it going. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote the first few lines of that song. Yeah, it sounds like they had quite the partnership. Mm -hmm. They were amazing together. They were so cute. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not just just in love, but just like collaboratively in love. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. That's a really good story. Oh, that's amazing. Well... You know, in our first year um, as a festival, we worked with you to uh, to create and confer that first ever Elmo Williams Award for exceptionally promising young filmmakers who present their work at the festival. And so last year we uh, gave that very first award to a young filmmaker named Robert Stronger. So he uh, he wrote and directed a film called uh, Parking Spot. It was a it was a short. It was an, an action comedy, but it was it was really cute it was a really fun film it was a fan favorite and um you know if i understand right uh he so he was really not when once he got the award and like he knew kind of understood what it was about he was really enthusiastic about learning more about elmo's life and his legacy and so he ended up getting connected with you to learn more about that and spend some time with you um what was it like just spending time with robert a young filmmaker who's who's coming up in his career and and sharing your memories of elmo with him what was they like he was such a sweet guy. I mean, Sue called the next day, can you know, can you take him around or tell him more things type of stuff? Yeah. So what I did is some of the Elmo things that I had co- multiple copies of, I would give him a copy, but I packed him up in the car and we uh, went to Elmo's house because I know the neighbor that lives there now. I says, can I bring him in your house yes. and show him around? And she said, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I brought him around and he was just so sweet. You know, it just was so you know, you think of Hollywood people and filmmakers as being, you know, just just stuck up and all that kind of stuff. He wasn't. He was just such a nice guy. Mm-hmm. I took him to the park. We went to the Capella. Uh, we went to the, two, you know, there's two markers yeah. to Elmo in the park. Mm-hmm. There's that one um, lawn calls it. It's an, an early gravestone for him. Oh, but really? He wrote the poem that's on there. Yes. And it's got a very nice... Uh, the facial picture type mm-hmm. thing of, of Elmo. Mm-hmm. And then uh, that sculpture by uh, Manuel, and what's his last name? Uh, Lopez. Lopez, thank you. Manuel Lopez mm-hmm. in the center, you know, with the children dancing type of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's a plaque, a round plaque in there mm-hmm. to Elmo and Lorraine. Oh, I don't know that. That's yeah, really yeah. great. Mm-hmm. I'm great. I love the the tie. Um, I know yeah, well, what, I that's <laughs> uh, one of our board members, Judy May's late husband, and uh, just just like hearing those like local connections with people in that creative way is just so lovely to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so, um, as far as upcoming Elmo Williams Day celebrations in terms of like future f- future preservation projects or teaching projects or anything. Um, what, what's coming up next for next w- Alma Williams Day? Or, or um, have any plans been made yet for that? Is anything special planned? Well, I know the date. It's already reserved at the Capella. It'll be April 27th and mm-hmm. uh, 2025. And then it's also reserved over at the Chetco Playhouse because okay. they said that they would show the movie again because that worked out so well. Yeah, yeah. It really did. Mm-hmm. And we haven't picked the movie yet. And we're kind of, uh, you know, some people want this and some people want that because okay. it's worked on so many good movies so i'm not mm-hmm. sure but whatever one it is i'm going to again trying to get some of the excerpt from the um uh, interview by elmo so we can hear elmo in his own words and by the way i really thank you guys for with the film festival for helping to promote okay. with elmo and all that stuff mm-hmm. because i don't want him to to die out his memory mm-hmm. 
You know, and so again, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping me do this. Yeah, it's been, well, thank you for, for sharing so much about his life being so open and willing to talk about it for, for you know, just, just working so hard to keep that memory alive. Well, I've got to tell you what, uh, another thing, though, because it's in my mind. How, you know, I teach probability and statistics, and we laughingly say that the probability of any one thing happening is so small that it's surprising that anything ever happens at all. <laughs> when I was a kid... My dad was working the swing shift, and he'd wake me up at 2 in the morning because, you know, I'm dating myself, but this was before VHSs and DVGs and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you watch movies when they were on. At 2 o'clock in the morning, he'd be coming home from work and knocking on my door. And oh, and there's a James Cagney film on. You want to come watch it with me? Uh-huh. So I go trotting down the stairs and watch a James Cagney movie with him. Mm-hmm. The funny thing is, is my favorite actor, who was before my time, I'm not that old, mm-hmm. was Gary Cooper. Okay. And when I was a kid, we went to downtown Chicago, actually to Old Town, so on the north side of it. Mm-hmm. And I bought an ink print, you know, like 25 out of 300 type print mm-hmm. of Gary Cooper in his hat from High Noon. Oh, my God. And I had that. And like 40, 50 years later, I moved to Elmo three doors down. So it was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this, oh, right? Yeah, so yeah. I went over there and I asked him, would you please sign this? Oh, sure. So he signed it for me. Mm-hmm. And then I gave it to my son. So it's in his office at the State Archives now. Oh. But it was like, how could that happen? I mean, seriously, how could that happen? Oh, no. oh yeah. No, and so like serendipitous. It was, yeah, like it was fate, you know? Oh, it yeah. It really was fate. Uh, I, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Well, Dr. Marilyn Hart, thank you so much for your contained work and sharing Elma Williams' history and legacy with our community. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And again, thank you so much for your support for keeping Elma alive. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Kat Liddell. And that's it for this episode of Wild Rivers Film Radio. This year, the Wild Rivers Film Festival runs August 15th through 18th in Brookings, Oregon. And if you want to learn more about the festival, buy festival passes, volunteer for us, or even sign up to be a sponsor, there's still time to do that. You can learn more and get in touch with us at wildriversfilmfestival.com. You can also find the Wild Rivers Film Festival on Facebook and Instagram. Recording for this episode was done by me. Editing was done by me. Our producer is Tom Bozak. Today's guest was Dr. Marilyn Hart, and I'm Kat Liddell. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Wild Rivers Film Radio. We'll see you next time. <laughs>